Good morning and welcome to our final 10.30 service in August. Uh, next week, uh, September the 5th, we will be back with Highfield Kids and Youth Church. We'll be meeting in person, so really, really look forward uh, to seeing you then. This is our final pre-record. Of course, if you want to come to an in-person service, there is a 6.30 uh, this evening, which is a prayer and praise again at the Vicarage Garden, uh, 36 Brookvale Road. Uh, you're very welcome to come along, just need to sign in at the door. Uh, but this service, our final one, taken from the de devoted midweek teaching series, is devoted to generosity and to justice. Um, so I'm just going to read from Matthew 6 in a second or two, um, as this is one of the main readings that we uh, looked at. Matthew 6, uh, verses 19 to 24. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus continued, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Father, as we remember the spirit of generosity and justice that filled that first church, help us to be as generous hearted towards you and towards others as they were. Give us the same commitment to justice, we pray. Amen. Now let's worship together.
Confess I dread getting handwritten notes through the door. Sometimes they are really lovely and encouraging, 
sometimes are a bit annoying, like the time when we were trying to have a holiday at home and I got a letter that began, as you've sensibly switched both your mobile and your email off because you're on holiday, I'm reduced to writing to you, which was a bit annoying. And occasionally they can be a little bit rude. So I confess my heart sank uh, when I came home to find an envelope with my name printed on the front just before Christmas. My heart sank, but I was really moved when I opened it. It was an anonymous gift of six £50 Sainsbury's gift cards. And I was asked simply in the typewritten note with no uh, name at the bottom to give them to six members of the congregation who were in need, which I duly did, mostly anonymously by putting them through people's letterboxes. It was an amazingly generous gesture and because it was utterly anonymous and I passed it on anonymously where I could, it meant that the motives of the person giving were absolutely pure. There were no strings attached to their giving, whoever it was, I don't know. They didn't give in this way to get anyone else's approval or, or to make people beholden to them or to see them differently. It was done for no other reason than the Father's well done. Another way we see generosity through Highfield is, is through our giving to our mission partners, both here and abroad. Uh, prior to the pandemic, week after week, church members would come in through the West Store and would bring food to distribute through Basics Bank. That was putting food on the tables of people in Southampton who are genuinely struggling to feed themselves and their families. We also support organisations like Communicare, a local Christian charity trying to plug some of the care gaps in our city. And we give away at least 10% of our given income every year to a total of 17 mission agencies of partners, both in this country and abroad, as I said before. Generosity, of course, isn't always just about giving. Sometimes we have to be prepared to receive and to have the humility to do that. I'm speaking to you from the log cabin in our garden that's now been my office for nearly eight years. It's also a testimony to just to generosity. Let me explain why. When, when first appointed, we couldn't see how we could make the vicarage work. We'd realised that, uh, that Graham and Di had tried in lots of different ways to do so. The study was supposed to be in the middle of the house and I struggled with loads of noise around me. I struggled with that. I struggled to concentrate. Now our kids are still pretty noisy now, but then they were 13 and 16 and I couldn't see how we'd make it work without quite a lot of tension. And to every suggestion we made to the diocese, the diocese simply said no. But after my appointment had been announced in Bletchley, my last parish, I was approached by someone called Simon. He told me that he had been instructed by God some years before to invest some money for me. The Lord had told him simply that I was going to need it. The amount by then had grown to an amazing £12,000, which paid for my log cabin, which I'm standing in, in its entirety. I was humbled and overwhelmed, and I still am. It has been an amazing blessing, a place of peace, a place where I encounter God day by day. And particularly during the pandemic, as it's meant that I could at least somewhat separate work from home. Long before I even knew what the problems were going to be, the Lord had determined to provide and had done so through Simon. It was an amazing testimony to see God's provision and to see Simon's obedience and his astonishing generosity it was also a huge encouragement to me that God was going before us and calling us here, an encouragement we sometimes needed to remember over the last eight years. Similarly, we see a devotion to generosity, a work in the first church described in Acts. Acts 2, 40 to 45, all the believers were together, we read, and had everything in common in verse 44. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Again in Acts 4, 33 to 34, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it all at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. 
You know, there wasn't a rule that you had to do this. Acts 5, 4 makes it clear there was no compulsion either to sell property or to give away the whole proceeds. It was a response, a personal response to God's prompting. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And at the heart of generosity is trust. Trust that the Lord will provide. Trust that the Lord will come through for us. Trust that he will do that even when it seems that he cannot or hasn't done yet. As Hebrews 13.5 has it, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. It is easy, or at least it is easier, to be generous ourselves when we have known the Lord's trustworthiness in the past. I wish I could say Simon's generosity to us had completely taken away my tendency to worry about money. I have to confess it hasn't. But also that I have found it much easier to trust the Lord and to be generous myself as a consequence. But you might be thinking, why? Why should a disciple be devoted to generosity? First reason, generosity stems from gratitude. It stems from gratitude. Gratitude for what? Well, gratitude for all that God has given us in creation. The focus is rightly these days because of the climate crisis and what we're doing to the planet, but sometimes we forget, I think, to celebrate all the amazing richness of the earth that we have been given to appreciate and to enjoy that sustains us in life. When looking at all that had been given to enable the building of the temple, which was an expression of the generosity of the people, David prayed, Yours, Lord. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendour for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. On Chronicles 29, 11. That used to be the read at the offering prayer and communion services. And the response was, all things come from you and of your own do we give you. The sense was the giving back, a giving back a proportion of all that we have received in thanksgiving. Gratitude comes from all that God has given us in creation. It also should flow from all that God has done for us in redemption. As Paul writes in Romans 12:1, Therefore I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. In view of God's mercy, in view of all that God has done in and through Jesus for each of us. In the view of all that Jesus did for us, respond in gratitude, Paul is urging us. Respond by offering our whole selves as a sacrifice. The offering of our lives in a way that's holy and pleasing to God. For you cannot stand at the foot of the cross, cannot stand at the foot of the cross and be unmoved or be unmoved and unwilling to respond in thankful gratitude. Or if you are, you haven't yet grasped who Jesus is and what he was doing there, what he was doing for you there. Their devotion to generosity in that first church flowed from the overwhelming sense they had that God had forgiven them through Jesus and that God had filled and empowered them through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The only appropriate response, the only appropriate response was to be generous to God in return. Sometimes possible, I think, to focus on what God has not or has not yet done or on what God has not yet given. And that can sow disappointment in us. We have to remember to thank God for all that he has done, all that he has given and all that he will always be for us before we dare to ask for what we haven't yet received. Second reason why a devoted disciple should be devoted to generosity, to put money in its place, to put money in its place. Jesus taught us that money is a power that seeks to dominate our lives. No one can serve two masters, he said. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, Matthew 6:21. Money and possessions, Jesus said, compete for our attention. They compete for our devotion. He said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. Money is a massive spiritual issue. It dominates many people's lives. 
We never seem to have enough. Whether we're really rich or really poor, we never seem to have enough. It wants, as money does, body and soul. Spending £20 on a takeaway doesn't bother us. Giving £20 away on the collection plate does. Spending £100 a month on broadband and TV, TV is something many families would do without much thought. But giving an extra £100 a month away would make most of us pause. We're happy to give away stuff we've no longer got a use for, especially if it then justifies us getting new stuff. But giving away new stuff doesn't compute. We don't understand that. Money has got a hold of nearly all of us. The only question is how much of a hold. But giving, generosity loosens that hold. Giving to God can break that hold. For giving money away puts it in its place. We don't just give it away, we give away its hold over us. We say that it is it cannot dominate our lives. And giving money to God, giving money to the family business we call the church, that's a really powerful and significant way for us to put our treasure where it deserves to be. I wonder how much of a challenge it is for us as devoted disciples to put money in its place as you give it away, you put it in its place. Third reason why we should be devoted to generosity, to support the work of the church. There are lots of ways in which we can be generous to the work of the church, lots of ways in which we can invest in the family business. We can be generous in terms of time through volunteering to serve. We can be generous in terms of our talents using both our secular gifts and our spiritual gifts to strengthen the church and its mission. And we can be generous in terms of our treasure, bringing money to the Lord's feet to use for his glory through the church. Pretty much Everything we do as a church depends on the giving of us as disciples, devoted disciples, in one or more of these ways. Many depend on all three, honestly. Everything we spend locally is raised locally. We're a net contributor to the diocesan budget. And remember, we give 10% of everything given away to support mission and relief agencies both here and abroad. And honestly, all of our ministries would close. They would close without us as people giving our time and our talents through them. Now, not everyone can give all three, their time, their talents and their treasure. But devoted discipleship means giving generously in at least one of these ways. And of course, not everyone can give always. For yes, there are seasons when we haven't got time to serve, seasons when it's harder to give financially, seasons when our work or our family demands everything we've got. I know that, I understand that. But the thing is, seasons should pass. And if a season never comes when you can give generously in these ways, I have to ask, where is your treasure? Because that's not what devoted discipleship looks like. Much of our giving goes to support our staff team. Luke 8, 1 to 3 talks about the band moving around with Jesus as he was ministering. And we read there, the 12, the apostles, the 12 were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. And then Jesus, or then Luke's gospel names them. And then he says, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. So they were using these women, their time, talents and treasure to support Jesus and the apostles on the road. Again, Acts 6 describes the apostles being set apart for the ministry of the word and seven others then being set apart to steward the food and the property of the church. It seems that they were being supported by the church as they did this. So there is a balance to strike, of course, between having paid staff and relying on volunteers. But that balance has been there from the very beginning. And people were set apart and supported in specific roles in the church, even in that first devoted community, that first devoted community that we're using as our example and our model. So devoted discipleship means being devoted to generosity. And that means investing our time, talents and treasure in and through the family business. We call the church. 
Honestly, I hate teaching about money. It is a hard, hard subject, and it is a critical spiritual issue. The only one less popular, honestly, is sex. But the devoted discipleship we see in Acts 2, 42 to 47, shows us that generosity was a key characteristic of that first church we're using as our inspiration. Now that generosity stems from gratitude. It's an expression of thanks to God for all that we've received in both creation and redemption. That generosity puts money in its place for its spiritual power that competes to be our treasure uh, to, for our treasure, a spiritual power that wants us body and soul. And that generosity invests our time, talents and treasure in the family business, both locally and across the world. I wonder how this challenges you. I know I've had my own challenges on this score over the years. I wonder how this invites you to be part of sharing with God in his work in the world, as was our friend Simon, as was our anonymous friend at Christmas, and as are all those, all those who invest their time, talents and treasure in and through the family business we call Highfield. What is the Lord's challenge to you? What is the Lord's invitation to you uh, to become devoted to generosity? You're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven that you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll
Father, as we come before you, we recognise that we find it hard to trust you with everything you have. That word from Hebrews 13.5 really challenges me. Uh, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. And you want to say why? And uh, the writer quotes, because the Lord has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We're reminded that Paul wrote, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And we've just been singing about you as a promise-keeping God. So Father, help us to trust you. Help us to be generous towards you and your work. Help us to respond in love to those around you and help us to be those who do justice in our lives and in the world. Amen. Of course, if you want to know more about how to support the work of the church here at Highfield, uh, please uh, ask for details of the parish giving scheme, which is now online, uh, or simply uh, go through the um, Facebook page, not the Facebook page, the church desk page on our website, which uh, is another place where you can give. Thank you to all who give their time, their talents and their treasure to the Lord through Highfield. Uh, we simply couldn't manage without you. A final prayer. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And look forward very much to seeing uh, you in person at 1030 services over the coming weeks. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.